Matthew chapter 25, please. Matthew 25. I want to speak to you about the, the final reckoning of a silent witness. The final reckoning of a silent witness. Father, thank you so much, God. Thank you so much, Jesus, for the touch of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your words, which you give to us, which are a light for our feet and a lamp for our path. God, we bless you, Lord, for the touch of truth that transforms us from the inside out. I thank you, Lord, for your willingness to put your Holy Spirit upon this frail vessel week after week. And God, you give me the ability to, to lift and to encourage your people and to see men and women brought into the strength that you offer so freely to all of us. I pray, God, for those that are wavering this morning in their faith, their willingness to follow Christ. I pray, God, this be a day of decision. Lord Jesus, let us be a witness everywhere we go today. Whatever we're called to do, help us not to be silent, but to be willing to live for you and to speak your name. Bless you, God, for how gracious and merciful you are. Thank you for the witness of the Holy Spirit. For Jesus, you yourself said, if I bear witness of myself only, my witness is not true. But there's another that bears witness of me, even my Father. And so, Lord, I ask for the witness of the Holy Spirit, that these words that I will speak this day have come from your heart. God, help us to pray like we've never prayed before. Help us to recognize the dark hour that we're now living in. Help us, God Almighty, to turn back to you as a people. Help us to pray in your house. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. Now these are words right from the mouth of Jesus Christ. He's teaching the multitudes. And he's giving a panoramic view, in a sense, of the kingdom of heaven, how God's kingdom works. And when we come to the finish line of this kingdom, what kind of a, a reckoning is going to happen at that day? These are not idle words. These are not false words. These are not words that you or I can get around. This is a, a vivid, accurate description of something that is coming all of our way who call ourselves by the name of Christ. Verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants, that would be you and I, called by the name of Christ, and delivered unto them his goods. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents, and behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. In other words, you, you are taking in a harvest where you've not planted and you're gathering in that which you've not harvested. Now I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth and lo here that thou hast is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. 
Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury, with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which has ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But for him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now it's wonderful to know that Christ loves us. It's wonderful to know that he went to a cross, gave his life, and is willing to give us a perfect love, an, an awareness of our own acceptance with God that casts out all fear. It casts out the fear of the day that we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. It casts out of our hearts the fear of the hardness of the faces of men and sends us into this world to live lives that bring true honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In spite of the fact that God is so willing and wonderful, there is a day of reckoning for everyone who's ever been called by the name of Jesus Christ. That day is coming. You will alone stand before the throne of God, and so will I. I have a wholesome and a holy fear of God in my heart, for I will answer not just for myself as a Christian man, what I've done with the talent of God or the deposit of God in my life, but I will also answer for you. Every person who's ever sat in this house and listened to my voice, every person on the internet who downloads and listens to the messages from this church, I bear a specific responsibility because I stand in this pulpit and declare that I am speaking from the heart of God. And I see no more solemn warning in the entire Bible than to those who stand publicly and say, God has spoken if God has not spoken. And it causes a fear in my heart when I stand and causes me to seek him with the best that I know how and the best that I believe to stand and say, I feel in my heart that God has given this word to me. In this parable, we see the investment of God's own son. He invested his son into this world. He invested the blood of his son for our redemption and then subsequently invested his own life through the Holy Spirit that Christ made available to us into our lives. And it was for his purpose, through us and in our time. Now, in the book of Ephesians, I'm just gonna read it to you, chapter four, verses seven and eight. The scripture says, unto every one of us is given grace, that means ability, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Unto every one of us is given grace, the ability to do something. Or may I put it this way, to allow God in us to do something that will bring his own name to glory. The ability to yield and let God be God, to let the Holy Spirit guide us. To open our hearts and receive the promise of God, which is a new mind, a new heart, and a new spirit. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. To go on that journey and to say, God, I yield my life to you. I accept the fact that you have taken my captivity captive. All my limitations are now gone. All my prison doors must open. My wounds of the past cannot any longer drag me down. I'm no longer confined by what people said I was or wasn't or where I was going or not going. There's a new word over my life now. I have a new sense of destiny inside of my heart. And I yield and trust that I will become, by the grace of God and by the giftings of God, by the deposit as it is of God's life within me. I will become everything that God has called me to be. And I believe that he will make us a living testimony to the reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God he rose from the dead and he does sit as King of kings and Lord of lords at the right hand of God. The Bible speaks in this parable of, of talents, but these talents are not like abilities to play the guitar, or sing a song. They're often spoken about that way, but that's not the context of it. That's not actually the meaning of it. The talents are a coin, it's, it's currency. And it speaks about the deposit of Christ's life and his victory into each of us. To do that 
which will please his heart and bring glory to his name. You have a calling on your life, just as I have on my life, and it's exclusive to you. And in order to fulfill that calling, remember that in, in Corinthians, the scripture says that God places us, the Holy Spirit places us in the body of Christ as he sees fit, not as we see fit, but it's his choice. He, the moment you receive Christ into your heart, that deposit of God's life came to you and he said, I've called you to do something. I will walk with you. I will give you the strength. All you have to do is believe that what I've called you to do will be accomplished through my life within you. It's an amazing journey when you begin to come to this realization in your heart that you have the deposit of Christ's life to do what you're called to do. Now, many people think the five talent people are the ones in pulpits. That's not so. I may only require two talents from God to do what I do, but every single mother here that has to drag four reluctant kids to church every Sunday, you may need five talents to do what you do. You may need five talents to go into the workplace that you have to work in or to survive in the family into which you were born as a testimony of Christ. You may need a lot more grace than I do. And so it's not the way corporate America would look at this parable. Many people are given more, are in an environment where they need more than I do to do what God's called me to do. The commitment of Christ to us was total. He paid the full price to the last ounce of his strength and drop of his blood. On our part, your part and mine, we are asked to follow him by faith and be open witnesses to that which he's willing to do for every person who will turn to him for salvation and new life. That's my calling on the earth and that's yours. I'm not called to impress people with knowledge or words or abilities. I'm called to tell you and you're called to tell others that what Jesus has done for me Jesus will do for you. He saved me and the change in my life is an evidence of that salvation. I have an evidence of that salvation. I have a new heart, I have a new mind, I have a new spirit. I have giftings that God gave to me that were never part of my life before. The ability to care, the ability to speak, the ability to be touched with the weaknesses of others, things that were never part of my character ever at any time now given by the life of Christ that is within me to do what I'm called to do. And that's the way it is for you. That's the way it is for me. I'm called to follow him by faith. I'm called to move through every door he opens before me to trust him. I'm called to follow that, that strange inner leading of my heart that was never there before. You'll have these leadings of God. It's, it's, it's a desire to do something that was never there. You know it comes from God because it wasn't in you before. And he's willing to do this for every person. Now we're not saved by doing works, but rather it becomes a natural outworking of those who are saved because the life of God is within us. Folks, I, nobody, I never started sharing Christ because of a program. I shared Christ because I had to. The life of Christ was in me. If, if, if Christ be in us, there has to be a, a new heart. There has to be an ability now to care and to move into the mass of confused and dying humanity and with a message of life. I'm not talking about works that save a person because works don't save any of us. James chapter two, verses 17 to 20, put it to rest says, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will you not know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Vain means, will you not know, O hollow, aimless, unaccompanied by the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit man? That's actually the full definition of that. Will you not know, O empty man, that faith without an outworking of that faith is dead? If something is in me, it has to show somewhere. It's got to come to the surface in my life if I'm willing to let God be God in me and to carry on his work, because that's the reason you and I are on the earth, to carry on that work of Christ, to, to lead people to that wonderful redemption 2,000 years ago until the day that the door closes and the opportunity to receive him has passed. 
There will be a day of reckoning for every one of us who claim to belong to Jesus and to be a partaker of his life. Now, I used to think that the judgment of the one talent person was rather harsh. Jesus said, take the talent from him and give it to him that has ten. For every one that has shall be given and have abundance from, but from him which has not shall be taken away that which even he has. I used to think it was very harsh until I understood the actual affront that his testimony was in the face of Jesus Christ. Listen to his words. He says, I was afraid. And well, actually in verse 24, he says, says, then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you have not strawed. And it's an incredible, the word hard here in the original text, Greek text means you were harsh, an unfeeling man. And it implies an accusation that Jesus Christ somehow possesses a harsh and inhuman character. And he said, you went out and you, you reap where you, you've not sowed and you gather where you've not strawed. In other words, I knew you were an unfeeling man and you have sent me out to do a work into which you yourself have invested no effort and have suffered no personal cost. It's an accusation of Christ. You sent me out to do a work and you, you yourself have invested nothing in it. It's such, a, it's such a slap in the face of Christ. It's such a spitting on the image of God who sent his son to a cross to die for all of us. It's such a, a spiritual ignorance of the day of Pentecost and, and what really God did because of that cross and that victory and how his Holy Spirit came upon a people for the sole purpose that we could be a testimony, witnesses in all the earth until the end comes. I knew, he said, you were a hard man. And he says, I was afraid, verse 25, and I went and hid your talent in the earth and here what you have is yours. In other words, I lacked the conviction or the moral courage to believe that what you had called me to do and what you had given me to do it was sufficient to get the job done. You called me to do something, in other words, that, I, that was impossible. And I was afraid. You see, the scripture tells us that he who is not perfected in love is, is filled with fear, basically. But once that love of God is in our hearts, once we know that we're fully accepted by God, once we've allowed the Spirit of God to let us be partakers of that which caused God to send his son to a cross, then we are compelled to begin to speak and we're compelled to begin to reach out. I don't think I'm different than other Christians, but when God received me as his own and when his Holy Spirit came into my heart, nobody had to tell me to share Christ. Everybody tried to stop me from sharing him. I couldn't stop. In my heart, I saw the, the incredible love of God for people, and I saw the incredible lostness of people without God. I saw clearly that there was an end to this journey called planet Earth, and all of those who are on the wrong side of the salvation that God freely offered are, are headed into an eternity of torment that is unspeakable to the point where our natural minds can't comprehend it. And understanding these things and having a sound understanding of it, I was compelled to tell people about Jesus Christ. How could I be silent at such a time? I'd be as guilty as a man walking down the street, seeing my neighbor's house on fire and just keep walking and say nothing. And let he and his wife and his children and family perish in the fire saying, well, it's not my concern. I don't have any equipment. I can't break down a door. I can't do anything. You see, that's what this man said. I, I, I was afraid. I was afraid of the rejection of men. I was, I was afraid of my own frailties. I, I was afraid, but it's, it's, a, it's an absolute denial of the cross, this fear that was in this man's heart. It's an absolute denial of the cross and the power of God when we will not speak at such a time as this. When we see this generation we're living in perishing before our eyes, our families being destroyed. When we see morality melting into the sidewalk like an ice cube on a July day, 
when we see the confusion all around us socially, morally, politically, the breakup of family as we've known it, the destruction of everything godly, God forbid that we should hold our peace. God forbid that we should be silent when people are dying, people are crying out. I see it now in the prayer requests coming into this church, folks. And I can't help but wonder, is there nobody in Alaska? Is there nobody in Arizona? Is there nobody in Minnesota to speak to these people? Where's the church of Jesus Christ? That men and women are crying out for freedom. They're crying out to be delivered. They're crying out to be fathers. They're crying out to, for their children. They're crying out. And they have, to, they have to send a text to New York City. I can't help but wonder, where's the prayer meetings in their town? Where's the praying church? Where are the people crying out to God? Where's the place that they can go? Why do they have to text to New York City? There has to be an awakening, folks, in America. We don't have a whole lot of time to get this right. There has to be an awakening. I was afraid. I was afraid to speak. I was afraid of the faces of men. I was afraid that I'd be mocked. I was afraid that I'd be laughed at. I was afraid that there was an insufficient resource within me to get the job done, so I stayed silent. And he said, so here is your life back to you with no profit at all to your kingdom. Here am I, Lord. The silent witness one day arrives at the throne of God, was in church, sang the songs, but never shared anything about Christ with anybody. Never spoke, possessed no burden, very little evidence of the true life of Christ, and stands one day at the throne of God and says, here am I your beloved and your prize. And the Lord says to him, in verse 26 in the King James is actually not a very good translation of this verse. The inference here, when you study it in other texts is, oh, is this the kind of man that you thought I was? It's actually a question. Or it said this way in another one, oh, this, you thought I was this kind of man, did you? If so, you thought I was a man who, who demands a harvest but puts no effort into it. Sends people out to do a work but puts no deposit of strength in them to do it. You thought I was just sitting in heaven with my arms folded and giving you nothing to get the work done that I've called you to do. You should have at least put out my deposit I put within you to those who were doing something. You should have at least encouraged those who were investing in my kingdom. And then the deposit I gave to you would come back to me with interest. You should have at least encouraged somebody. Should have at least helped somebody, supported somebody, a missionary, anybody that's doing something for the kingdom of God. You may not have had the courage yourself, but... He tells this man with one talent, essentially, you could have done this. It, actually, the inference would be that I would have accepted it. Years ago, I met a man that I, I once knew a man years and years and years ago. When I, there was a season in my life when I was, I, was, I was really opposed for speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I was actually threatened by people that I worked with. I couldn't help but share Christ. I remember I was, I was called in by my boss one time and he said, this is not an evangelistic association. <laughs> and he says, you are a police officer, you are not a preacher. He was wrong about that, but that's what was his opinion. <laughs> and he said, if, if I ever get wind of you doing this again, you're going to be in huge trouble, my friend. And of course, they had the power to do that. And so it was, it was the same week after he'd threatened me that I was called out. I was in public relations at this time and I was called out to a community group to talk about doors, locks, bars, all that stuff. It was uh, a neighborhood talk for people who were experiencing trouble in their neighborhood. And so I've, I've got this kit and I've got showing them how to put bars in their basement windows and Jimmy proof locks on their doors and stuff like that. And, as I'm doing the presentation, this lady raises her hand in this group and she says, officer, 
I have a question. I said, what's your question? I thought it was about what I was talking about. She said, you're talking about crime. You're talking about alertness. You're talking about sealing windows and doors. But everything in you is saying something else. She said to me, what is it that I'm seeing? And I'm just thinking about the threats I've just had. There's about... I don't know, I don't remember the number of people, let's, let's roughly say 60 people in this meeting. And I said to her, ma'am, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and, and God has absolutely transformed my life. Now, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about this unless, as a group, you unanimously want me to, then I will. <laughs> And everybody in the room raised their head and said, yes, we want to hear this. We want, so I've closed my kit and we went to church. Praise God, we had an awesome evening. And there's nothing they could say about it because we are servants of the public, supposedly. And, uh, <laughs> and if the group asks for it, I'm, I'm obliged to respond to it. But it was a tough go. It was hard. I was threatened. I was set up one time. Thank God the Lord protected me. Um, it's not something I can really talk about, but it was dirty what they did. And then years later, I met a man that was part of the camaraderie of where I worked. And uh, he, he meets me and he says, praise the Lord. And I said, oh, wow, when did you get saved? because I'd known this guy for a long time, and he said, oh, I've always been a Christian. I was raised to believe in salvation by faith through Jesus Christ. I was stunned, because I was thinking in my mind, why then didn't you at least encourage me? When I was, you know, I was facing such opposition because I was an open testimony for Christ. And at least if you're going to live in the closet as a Christian, the least you could have done is invited me into your closet and just <laughs> encouraged me. You know, that's what he meant. He said, you, you could have at least put out your money to those that were using it. And you would have, at least it would have come back. Just a word, just a kind word. I know everybody here, you're not evangelists. You're not all called to speak to, to multitudes. But can you not encourage your pastor to pray? Can you not? Is there not something you can do? Is there, is there not some kindness that can come out of your mouth? Is there not some cup of cold water you can give to somebody who's serving God? I realize that not everybody has initially the courage to go out and speak to multitudes, but surely there's something you can do for those that are. And folks, that's the point. And that's what Jesus said. If, even if you believe this about me, I had put a deposit of my life into you. And you, if you at least could have used it for those who were standing up for the truth. The inference was, as I read it anyway, that I would have received that. That would have been sufficient. My money would have come back to me or my deposit with at least some interest. Now, Paul says to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, he said, Wherefore I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. My word to you today is, folks, stir up the gift of God. When, when God put his hand on you, he, he put something in you of his life. And he put within you the ability to do something that is supernatural. It's not of you, it's of God. Stir it up. So, you know, how do you stir it up? You just say, God, I want that. That's how you stir it up. I want that. I want my life to be what you've called it to be. I, I, I don't want to be so blended in with this society that I make no difference. I, I want the power to at least stand out. At least my speech, God, would betray me. May I say that? That I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. God, stir me. And I've prayed that all my Christian life. Stir me. Take me to another place. Don't let me become stagnant. Don't let me live on yesterday's grace and yesterday's victory. This is another day. There are new people I'm going to meet today. Stir me, oh God. Stir the, the compassion of my heart. 
stir, give me the eyes, God, that I've had from time to time to be able to see people the way you see them. Give me the tenderness of heart to care when I see somebody crying on their cell phone on the street corner. Give me the courage to stop. Don't let me be afraid of people's faces. Give me the ability, oh God, it can't be just, I can't just live in the past. I'm, I'm alive today and you're alive inside me today. So God, stir me. And that's the cry of my heart. Stir me, Lord Jesus Christ. Stir this gift that is in me. You laid your hands on me and you gave me your Holy Spirit for a reason. And you left me on the earth for a reason. So may I fully, fully appreciate and lay hold of that reason for which I'm alive and Paul says to Timothy, be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid, Timothy, of the testimony of Christ. Don't be afraid of the suffering that can come. The rejection, the ridicule, the laughter, the, the a society that's dying in its sin telling you you've lost your mind. Don't be ashamed, Timothy, and don't be afraid, but be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, it's going to be tough. Look at my life, Paul was saying to Timothy. I've been shipwrecked and stoned and beaten and betrayed and mocked and in chains and left in the deep. It's been tough, but Timothy, I have a love for people and a revelation of God that is rare in this world. Don't be ashamed, Timothy, but take that move, make that move and take that walk and stand up as a living witness to the reality of Jesus Christ. Don't turn your light off in the storm, Timothy. Turn it on and put it on a hill that all may see it. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, that means our own abilities, but according to his own purpose and grace given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He has called us but not by our abilities, because our abilities will fail. My love has limitations and so does yours. My courage only goes so far, then it will fail. My resolve, if left to myself, will eventually wane and die. But I have another inside of me, living inside of me. The, the living Christ through the Holy Spirit is inside of me. And there is a divine purpose for my life and there is grace given to me of God. That means the ability, the deposit of God through Jesus Christ is given into my life to accomplish what God allowed me to be born and born again for. Thank God. Stir up the gift. God has not given us the spirit of fear, Timothy, but a power and of love and a sound mind. God has given us the ability, the power to, to accomplish it. The only thing that stops the true child of God is unbelief. He's given us the power to accomplish it. He's given us the power to do what we're called to do. Nothing can separate us from that. Nothing can keep us from going through an open door that God has opened for us. Nothing can separate us from this love of God. He's given us love from God inside of us to carry us and help us and to feel the affection of his heart for people. You know, I think next to my salvation, next to my wife, next to my children and grandchildren, I have to say the greatest gift that God has ever given me is a love for you. It's an amazing thing. And God knows that's not an idle boast because I stand before him one day and give an account of my words today. It's not an idle boast. I cared for nobody in my younger years. I cared for nobody when I was a young cop. I was selfish to the core of my being, angry. And because people had been a source of pain in my life, I hated people. I, used to, I remember going through the supermarket. Pastor Teresa can verify this story. And I blurted out loud right in the middle of a supermarket with a shopping cart in my hands. I hate people. <laughs> people were a source of pain in my life for many, many years, and it's a miracle that I can honestly say I look out and I feel the love of God. As much as he's allowed me to feel it, I feel the love of God for people. I walk down the street and, and, I, and I see the debauchery now in this city and what goes on in the evenings, and I don't despise the people. 
I mean, the sin makes me cringe, but the people don't. I look on every man, woman that's created in the image of God. Yesterday, I went for a walk in the city for a while and I just prayed the whole time, oh God, please help these people. Please help that person. Please, God, help these that are captivated in their bondage. Help them to get free. It's one of the greatest gifts I've ever had. And I, I pray with all my heart that God would increase it. I remember when I was about 25, after I'd gotten saved, I was laying in bed one night and I began to weep. And uh, my wife said to me, why are you crying? And I said, I'm reading these verses in the scripture. God so loved the world. I'm reading that perfect love casts out fear. I'm re I just see love, 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 especially when you read John, you see love everywhere. And I don't feel it. I don't understand it. I don't know it. I can't give it. I feel like I'm a stranger looking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a store of a candy store, in the window of a candy store. I feel like a poor kid, don't have a dime in my pocket and I can't, I can't, I can see it, but I can't lay hold of it. And she said something to me I'll never forget. She said, Carter, before you die, she said, you're going to be known as a man of such love. She said, God's going to do such a miracle in your life. And I laid hold of that because I had a sense it was God through her speaking to my heart. And here I stand today, 35 years later from that moment. And it's true. God has really unlocked this area of my heart and poured in the measure of grace, the talent of his love that I would need to do what I'm called to do. For I, I couldn't do it in my own strength. It'd be hopeless. There's no course I could take, you know, love 101. And you come out just throwing flowers at everybody, you know, just chocolates, <laughs> you know, hugs. I mean, I, I used to, my skin would crawl when somebody would hug me, especially another man. I was just like, oh God, I would go into church and somebody would reach out and hug me. And I'm just like, uh, and, and, and my wife would say to me, and everybody, I, we went to this charismatic church after a couple of years, and everybody would say, uh, we lo I love you, I love you. And I would just stare at them, you know. And she would say to me, why don't you say it back to these people? And I said, because I don't love them. And I don't even like them. I'm not going to, not going to, I'm not going to lie. What a journey this has been. I've come a long way. And Paul said to Timothy, and God's given us a sound mind. And that's to know that our calling on the earth is worthwhile. It's, it's fully attainable. And it's eternal. It's worthwhile. It's attainable. And it's eternal. It's an incredible life in Christ. And so my challenge to you this morning is stir up the gift of God that's in you by the laying on of God's hands. When, when you came to Christ... God laid his hand on you and he deposited his Holy Spirit inside of you. And in that deposit of God were put giftings and abilities to do something that only God can do through you. You're unique in that. And so don't fall into a wrong thinking that it's not attainable in your life. It's not worthwhile and it's not eternal. Oh no, it is, it is all three of these things. He's given us the power to do it. He's given us love so that we're not motivated by a program or by compulsion or by a fear of hell ourselves when we get to the end. That's all, all those motivations are wrong. No, he's, he's put his love in us so that we are constrained by that love. That means we, we are literally pushed from the inside out to tell people that God loves them, to tell people that there is a hope, there's a future, to sometimes just reach in our pocket and give $5 to a man who's digging in the garbage for a sandwich. It isn't really that complicated, folks. And a soundness of mind, and that's maybe what I'm trying to appeal to this morning for those that are, may I call it, silent on the sidelines, to say this is right. What this pastor is speaking is right. It isn't right that I'd be quiet. It isn't right that I be silent in such a time as this. Esther Mordecai said, don't think you'll survive just because you live in a comfortable place right now. All hell is about to break out in the nation. And it will also affect the king's palace. So Esther, start to pray and go into the king and ask for grace. And this is what you and I are gonna to have to do in this generation. 
I want to worship for just a little while, and I'd like to give an altar call this morning. Now, by altar call, for those who are not familiar with church, it just means that you come to the front of this auditorium or between the screens in the annex or uh, in front of the sanctuary in uh, North Jersey at our campus in North Jersey. Or if you're at your home streaming, you can just go to your knees around about your coffee table or wherever you are and just pray together as a family. And just say, God, give us the grace to honor you on the earth and let not your deposit of your life in me be worthless. Lord, let my life count for good and for God. Work in me in a way that your name is brought to glory and the souls of people are touched because they see the reality of Jesus Christ. Not, is, I, that I'm not a program. I have a living relationship with the living God. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord, for you are truly calling a people to yourself at this time in which we're living. You are stating your heart to us that you're willing to give us everything we need. I'm reminded of those words where you say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God, I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, for an awakening in my heart. I ask for an awakening, Lord, a stirring for the pearl in the field to be found again. A willingness to sell what we thought was happiness, that we might embrace that which you have for us. I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all those that are visiting today from around the country to when they go home to never be the same again. To ask their pastors if they can start a prayer meeting in their church. To begin to reach out to the addicted, the homeless, and the oppressed. Let especially young men never be the same again, as well as the old and young women. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, give us an awakening, Lord, in our time. And let it begin in me. Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. We're going to stand, and if you would like to come forward to just make that dedication of your life this morning, I would like to invite you to do that. If we stand balcony, go to either exit, main sanctuary, just come forward to this front of this auditorium, and then we're going to worship for about, about five to six minutes, and we'll be dismissing you after that. We'll pray together. Just come, please. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to listen to these words now for you so you'll understand God's heart for you. Speaking of the bridegroom, in the Song of Solomon, the bride says these words, the roof of your mouth is like the best wine for my beloved. It goes down sweetly and causes the lips of those that are asleep to speak. I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. In other words, God loves me. He loves me, passionately loves me. And when I understand the depth of his love, it goes down into my inner parts and causes my mouth to speak. And now the bridegroom speaks. He says, come, my beloved, let's go forth into the field and lodge in the villages. Let's get up early to the vineyards and see if the vine flourishes and whether the tender grape appears and the pomegranates bud. There will I give you my love. The mandrakes give a smell, and our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for you, O oh my beloved. God says, get up and let's go into the work. Let's go into the vineyard. And let's, let's inspect what can be done there and what is being done there. And there you will understand my love. And there there are gifts for you laid up. Old ones that will get stirred up again and new ones that will come as you begin. Remember he said, take the, take the one talent and give it to the one who has 10. There's, there's a, there will be an abundance of the supply of the, God of, of the life of God for you. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for how tenderly you call us into your work. How tenderly, Lord, we see how you love us as your people and how you love those that are lost in this world. How much you're willing, Lord, to walk with us 
and give us the strength that we need to do what you've called us to do. You call us as partners in this work. You don't send us as slaves. You call us as partners. God, you promise that as we go into this vineyard, there will be giftings, new and old, that will be laid up for us. We receive that. We believe that. Help us, Lord God, to be vocal witnesses for the people who are lost in this generation. And give us the grace to encourage those who are standing up for truth. Lord, we bless you. I ask you, Father, for these that have gathered, Lord, that there be an understanding that the strength is of God, it's not of us. It all comes from Christ. Even before the foundation of the world, it was decreed that this should be given to us. Father, we thank you for it and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Praise God.